as possible, but I'll be uh, going through some slides just to give some context. Uh, don't hesitate to ask questions, um, whether in the middle or at the end. Uh, I just uh, want to make sure that we're all on the same uh, page for this uh, journey. And so the, um, the name of the presentation which uh, I chose is uh, really to, um, to illustrate the fact that uh, Blablacar is really a, a company which has a mission, which has had a mission since its beginning, so which is why it's uh, on the road with a purpose. And so I'll try to make a picture of uh, where we are today, where we're heading, uh, and also uh, in the end uh, a bit more about the uh, ecosystem in Europe for, for tech uh, in general, and not only Blablacar, which is an example, um, but there are many, many companies actually uh, flourishing now in Europe in this context. So, um, first of all, if we talk about the, uh, the car, um, not the car industry, but the, the, the car travelers, um, you know, 76% of the trips between 100 and 800 kilometers uh, in Europe are made by car still. We always think about trains and airplanes and, uh, and all this to move around, but actually they don't represent a lot uh, for, uh, for, for in terms of number. Uh, most of the people on those distances still use their cars, uh, which means the inventory of available seats in cars is just massive. Uh, it's like you've got three seats available per car almost. So the occupation rate uh, for car in Europe on long distance is 1.9. On short distance, it's uh, a lot worse than that because it's less than 1.1. It's 1.08, uh, which means so on short distance, meaning like the commuting trips in the morning and at night when people commute, usually they are alone. Uh, so which means that uh, more than nine cars out of ten uh, are with one uh, driver only on board and three available seats. Um, and so on long distance it's a bit better because people tend to, to share a bit the rides either with their friends or with, uh, with other uh, members of the families. But um, what we have in the network uh, for Blabla Car is uh, that we reach 3.9 people per car in our community. Uh, 3.9 includes the people we bring and also the people uh, that uh, the drivers themselves have brought. So it's not their own, they're not all brought by Blabla Car, but actually there is a better fill rate of the cars, which obviously turns into, and we'll see that, uh, a lot more savings, CO2 savings. Um, so um, a bit of numbers about BlaBlaCar today. It's, um, so it's a marketplace of shared road travel uh, for long and short distance, and also uh, carpooling, but also buses now. We've launched the BlaBla buses. I don't know if you've, uh, you had seen that. Um, so uh, it has, uh, as a Alex mentioned uh, 87 million uh, members in the community in 22 uh, countries. Um, I founded it in 2006, well actually I started coding in 2004, but then I incorporated the company only two years later. Um, it's uh, 25 million travelers per quarter, so like 100 million travelers per year. Uh, that's just to give you a sense of scale. Um, Eurostar has 10 million travelers per year, and we do 100 million, so it's 10 times bigger. Uh, Blah is 10 times bigger. We don't own obviously any car, any vehicle. Uh, it's just purely a marketplace that uh, places people in contact uh, to share their rights. We don't own the cars, we don't operate them, we don't drive them. It's just a pure uh, model of uh, sharing economy. Um, and then it turns uh, into a very good uh, savings. It's 1.6 million tons of CO2 saved per year. Uh, again, to give you a sense of scale on this, um, the entire city uh, of Paris uh, emits 1.3 million tons of CO2 per year uh, when you include cars, buses, uh, trucks, and the peripheric and everything uh, from uh, road traffic. So we save each year more than the entire uh, CO2 resulting from traffic, uh, road traffic in Paris. Uh, but so th this statistics is for the entire uh, network, obviously, in our 22 countries. But just to give a sense of scale, we compare that to um, the pollution that, it, that is emitted by a big city. Um, so what, what do we do and what's our vision? Our vision is really that uh, travel can be uh, also uh, a pleasure, I would say, and not only, uh, when, when we say travel, it's also uh, just moving around, but um, we, we make it very human. Uh, we have three values which uh, have been uh, really developed in the company through uh, many, many ways, but the culture itself, but also the vision. 
around uh, the fact that we believe and we want to bring freedom, fairness and fraternity in our community. Those are our three main values uh, that uh, are actually represented from the uh, spirit there is in the community and also the spirit we have in the team. Um, this is a gross chart uh, of where we are today. Um, so obviously, well, this was uh, the, the thickness of the line, but then after some point, when you get the product right, then you're able to, uh, to actually convince uh, more and more and more people, and then word of mouth uh, kicks in. And then you've got network effects, which make uh, two things. Not only you've got a better reality of uh, how people will talk about the service, but also you reach uh, some thresholds in the marketplace where actually when you're looking for, for something, you'll find it. Uh, because creating a, a C2C marketplace is a bit like creating uh, two companies at the same time. So one on the supply side and one on the, on the uh, offer side. Um, on the demand side, sorry. And, um, and so at some point when you've got enough supply and enough demand, you create enough matchings. But uh, the beginning is quite tough because you've got someone looking for a ride, uh, like let's say, uh, uh, let's say from uh, San Francisco to, uh, to Los Angeles to Morocco too, and someone offering a ride from uh, San Francisco to Sacramento uh, the day after tomorrow. And then you've got no way to match those two. So uh, this is what's happening for like, uh, months and years until uh, you get uh, sufficient mass and then it begins to kick in. So uh, critical mass uh, in this kind of network is super hard to reach, which is why um, in France it took us like uh, seven years to reach uh, one million members in 2011. Uh, but then now we do a, a million member every two weeks, uh, a million new members. So it's been accelerating with the uh, network effects, of course, and also for this growth we, uh, we raised some money in order to fuel this growth in a more traditional way with VC money, uh, in order to not have to wait for seven years until you reach one million members in the country. Uh, so today, this is uh, our footprint. Uh, so as you can see, we are not in the US. Um, not only we're not in the US, but what we do does not exist in the US, which is quite uncommon for, uh, for uh, I would say, a, a platform, uh, especially marketplace. Uh, so actually when I come here, so often uh, uh, people tell me, oh, you're like Uber. I'm like, no, I'm actually no, we're not like Uber. Also, you're like Lyft. No, no, we're not like Lyft either. Uh, we're something else. Uh, we're a long distance carpooling platform where people like you and me will share the seats. Uh, it doesn't make you a professional just because you share a seat with someone in the same way. Uh, and it's, um, it's simply a, a different kind of um, way to move around. And it's really an arrangement between people and it's actually a lot cheaper as well because you don't have to pay for the time of the driver. The driver is not working. The driver is just going somewhere, and you just share the cost. So, meaning, uh, if we were in the U.S., it would give you, it would bring you a possibility to drive from uh, San Francisco to Los Angeles for like 20 or 25 bucks. Uh, so, which wouldn't be the price, of course, of uh, an Uber from San Francisco to Los Angeles. I haven't tried that, but I think it would not be like 20 dollars. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I had forward uh, fast forward on the on the scale, but so Eurostar is uh, 2.5 million uh, passengers per quarter, so 10 million passengers per year. British Airways is 10 million passengers per quarter, and uh, blah 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 is 25. Uh, just to give you a sense of scale, because usually when, uh, especially when we're in the States, since the company is not known because we're a consumer service, but we're not in the US, uh, it, it's good to have some numbers because otherwise we don't realize what it is. What it means is that in terms of, uh, uh, in, in our core market in France where we started, uh, today we've got 17 million members in France, which is more than a quarter of the population. It's actually a third of the people who are uh, 18 years old or more. Uh, and if you look at the younger generation from 18 to 35, uh, from 18 to 30 actually, we've got 50% of the population which is registered with us. So it's becoming like a totally a massive service. Uh, absolutely everybody knows uh, the service in, in France. Uh, and then in other countries, like for example Russia, with the 25 million uh, users in Russia, um, a country like, uh, of uh, 160 million people. So it's really a very, very high penetration rate in those countries. In Brazil as well is rotating. Uh, we are reaching like, we've got more than 8 million members and still a, a three digits uh, year on year growth. So, um, uh, and then in other countries as well, it, it's uh, Rotating. Um, so this is um, just a picture of uh, our funding uh, story, I'd say. Um, so that's the uh, 
the, the friends and family. Uh, actually, we had placed with some other friends uh, 100,000 euros initially, but then the 600,000 euros here in 2009 with friends and family. Um, the, the goal was really to become the, uh, the, the dominant player in France when we raised this money because there were like 10 players at the time. Uh, then we raised 1.2 million and the goal then was to really find, uh, which like 1.2 million at the time was called the Series A. I know that Series A is not that anymore. Uh, it's like uh, sometimes almost 10 times that, but uh, at the time 1.2 million was a Series A, um, uh, at least in Europe. And uh, so this time the goal, and, and the reason why I'm saying this is because it's very important to understand that when you raise money, you better have one goal per fundraising. It makes things a lot easier. So when you arrive here and you're like, we're raising 600,000 euros to become the dominant player in France, we're raising 1.2 million here to prove the business model. Uh, then we're raising uh, 10 million to, uh, to expand the service uh, in the nearby countries. Uh, it makes things a lot easier and a lot clearer for the investors to know where the money will be placed. Uh, of course, you have to prove the previous steps in order to reach the next one. But um, when it works and uh, you, um, you are able to, to scale with different uh, goals each time, so then after uh, we were able to raise $100 million uh, for European expansion, then $200 million for global expansion. <coughs> and then some other strategic things, like for example, since uh, we, we launched uh, Russia in 2015 and we saw it was rocketing so much, uh, it was really picking up super, super fast. Uh, we decided to uh, have also uh, some uh, Russian investment uh, in the cap table as well to help us on the ground. And then also in 2018 we made a deal with SNCF because as you'll see in the overall strategy, uh, SNCF is the French railway company, uh, for those of you who are not French. Um, the, uh, and then uh, the, the reason for this uh, fundraise uh, is that uh, in, the, in the long term and hopefully mid term, uh, we will uh, become more and more multimodal and we'll be able to offer as well train tickets to be booked on the platform. Um, so, what we are doing today is really to, uh, we, we're building a unique and global network which is very granular. It's of, of course uh, affordable because it's based on the cost sharing. Uh, it's zero saving and it's powered by people and partners. And the thing is, um, the advantage we think we have in this uh, quest for becoming a multimodal uh, service or go to place marketplace for like, booking uh, different kinds of travels is that, uh, so today we're, we're offering long distance carpooling but also buses and also short distance carpooling with uh, another app for now which is called Blabla Lines and it's still testing even though we've got more than one million members now on Blabla Lines, we're still in the beta phase of the product. Um, the reason why we think we've got an edge in uh, becoming really the good marketplace for uh, for booking travels is that cars are actually a uh, universal plug-in for mobility. They can bring you just about anywhere in a pretty fast manner. Uh, you can go to uh, your grandma, you can go to the beach, you can go to the mountains, you can go to visit your family, you can go to the airport, you can go to the train station, you can go to just about anywhere, which is why, of course, cars were so, uh, so popular and, uh, and still are. Uh, and by combining this uh, strength of uh, the uh, car network with other uh, means of transport like the high-speed train or even the airplanes or buses, uh, then you're able to get the best of both worlds, meaning you can go super fast on long distances and then you're running on and you can get to your final destination with, um, with a car which can connect just about any point to any other point. So since we own this network of private cars, and it's uh, dozens of millions of cars, so it begins to be uh, sizable and uh, there's a density which is enough to be able to provide some uh, transport uh, solutions just about anywhere. Uh, we believe we have an edge in becoming a network where uh, you can combine high speed and uh, fast uh, and, and comfortable uh, travel with the best cost by combining also a train with carpooling or buses with carpooling and anything. <coughs> So, um, the other reason why we have an edge as well is because we already have incoming traffic of lots of people looking for traveling, so we already have this demand. So we can also pool the resources and we don't have to buy for additional marketing or what to get more traffic. And so we already have people looking for rides we can 
uh, in the long run do not only multimodal, which would be just offering several solutions, but also intermodal with interconnections. And we have the demand already. And by adding some other networks of buses or trains, we'll be able to actually uh, have an intermodal network, which is uh, very, very efficient. Um, that's a picture of the meeting points um, of blah blah car. Uh, I think it's in the day. Uh, so in Europe, uh, I'm not showing it in the US because it would be empty. Um, so um, in order to do that, we we've been through lots of steps. Uh, one of which is really to make sure that we were building trust in the network. Um, so. Uh, how did we do to build trust? Uh, we've been, uh, over the years, listening a lot to the community and making sure we were um, providing the right level of interactions and trust in the system so that people could get together. Uh, and this is an acronym that we created uh, for uh, the type of information that you need in a, in a million people network in order to create trust. So it's kind of a framework uh, which makes the best usage of the available data that you can get out of the internet and then combining them to create trust from people. So like we realized there are about six pillars of uh, uh, online trust that you can build on a platform like ours. When uh, people register, uh, they may declare their information. So this acronym will be like, so information you need in order to create the best trust in your network would be uh, information that is declared, rated, engaged, active, moderated on social. By declared, we mean uh, first name, last name, your picture, what you do in life, what you like, if you like jazz, if you're a math teacher, whatever. This is a declared information. Then you'll have the rated information, which is um, how people rate each other after rights. So of course, it's basic now, but it's uh, really something which is super important because when you have like, 54 ratings on someone, then your trust goes up uh, rather than zero. And um, they better be good ratings. So. Um, and then after engage, it's through a booking system you place online, which projects people in the transaction so that when you pay online, you prove that you will be here tomorrow at 6 p.m. for the ride. Uh, so this brings trust additionally as well. And so then we make the, the money transfer, so we get the money, and then we transfer the money to the driver once the ride has happened. Um, active, so this activity will be, for example, when um, uh, you, you know that the uh, members just uh, registered uh, either a month ago or three years ago, they made like uh, one ride or 159 rides, uh, you know that they were logged uh, an hour ago or what, so this activity thing is also an important uh, information for you to create your trust because you know that this person is active on the service and so it creates uh, additional trust as well. <coughs> Moderated will be uh, all the work we do to make sure we moderate exchanges to uh, really fulfill the goal of uh, having people traveling together and nothing more. Uh, so this is linked to the fact that we check the profiles as well. So we, we will check the ideas, we'll check the phone numbers, we'll check the emails, and also we provide customer support. And, uh, we're here to monitor the platform. So that's really where we add uh, our work as a platform. And then social, because we allow people to connect their profile with their Facebook or LinkedIn profile in order to uh, have uh, some kind of uh, um, a network identity as well. So when you connect and you see that someone has got like, I don't know, 450 friends on Facebook, well, you know that this profile may be a real one and it's not like someone faking the system. And when you do all this and you add all this stuff, then you, um, you are able to uh, create a profile which actually generates a lot of trust. Um, so we made actually, we wanted to measure that. So. Uh, we, we made a survey uh, in order to try to size how much trust there is in the Blah Blah Car community. And so we did that with another very good university. I don't know if I'm allowed to name it here. Um, no. Hmm. Edward Euster. Oh. Um, so uh, because there is a professor there called uh, Arun Sundar, Sundar Rajan, who's actually a worldwide uh, a trust person uh, researcher. Uh, so we made a survey with 18,000 respondents in 11 countries to try to size the amount of trust there is in the Blablacar network. Uh, so our methodology was to, uh, to ask people uh, what is your level of trust in this kind of people? So people who are connected on social media, people who are neighbors, your colleagues, your friends, your family. 
And then we said, okay, when on the, on the scale from zero to five, when people say two or five, we will call that high level of trust. Uh, and so then we make the percentage of people who answer four or five of the five. So you've got, um, uh, you've got, uh, as you can see, the top two, which are a friend of family at 92% and 94% for four or five out of five. Uh, and then uh, at the very bottom, you've got social media contact. Colleagues and neighbors are quite in the middle. And then, of course, the question we wanted to ask is how much trust do you have in a blood account member? Um, and um, the thing is, the difference between all those people is that for the family, friends, colleagues, neighbors, it's usually people you've met. You've really met them in real life, so you know what they look like. Uh, you shake hands, you whatever, you, I mean, you discuss with them, but you know them. Uh, social media contact, you don't always know them, but like all the other ones are people you met. And so then we were really interested to know how much trust people would bring to people they've never met. Uh, but thanks to the, the trust network we built, and so we asked how much trust do you have in people who have a complete profile, which we call drinks profile, so like all the dimensions are filled in. And actually, it is super, super, super high. It is 88%, so it's on the podium. Um, uh, which is totally crazy because it's the only people you never met. Uh, and then it generates a level of trust which is almost uh, as high as friends and family members, even though you've never met them. And by doing so, uh, and it, it's been architecture, I mean, all the trust has been architecture in the system, but by doing so, we're able to, of course, create new transactions between people who've never met, and then it brings us back to uh, the basics of economy, um, meaning that you can't generate a transaction without trust. Uh, each time there is a transaction, a money transaction, someone buys something, um, there is another layer in the head of the people who are exchanging money. Is it, can I trust what I'm currently buying? And then the seller has to prove that there is enough trust. Whether you buy uh, anything, it can, be, uh, it can be food, it can be a car, it can be whatever. But each time there is a, a transaction, there is a level of trust that is uh, associated with this transaction. So as soon as you're able to create a new layer of trust, like we did, you are actually uh, able to create a new layer of economy and a new layer of transactions, which could not happen before, uh, which is why we could call that the sharing economy. Or it's, it's a new kind of economy because the bridge for this economy uh, is made possible thanks to the trust that you're able to generate while you're having a transaction. <coughs> so um, then, other things uh, which are very important uh, and specific to carpooling are uh, long distance, the fact that long distance carpooling has so many advantages uh, and positive impacts. So we've made some other studies to really uh, n better know uh, what's driving and what's motivating people for carpooling. So um, we know 80% of our uh, members travel to see their loved ones and 60% uh, of them say that sex to blah blah cause the season more often. So we've got like a uh, uh, for example, divorced parents who are really uh, totally in love with us because thanks to us they can go visit their children maybe sometimes at the other end of the country with their cars and they still see their children and having a, like going out with them and everything. Um, I mean, literally I've had some people uh, like, uh, coming to me and taking me in their arms saying that you saved my life because now I see more like my children. And, and so these kind of people really love the service because they're able to travel with their car for, for less money. Um, also, some other people whom uh, we save, um, it's more on the money side possibly, but like people who have to commute because they live somewhere, but they work somewhere else, maybe sometimes uh, two or three hundred miles away, and so they stay during the week uh, at their workplace, and then they come back to their family place for the weekend, but then uh, it costs a lot of money to commute. <coughs> and then I'm often asked as well, so why is Blablacom not in the US? Uh, so. Um, and why what we do does not exist in the U.S. Uh, actually, as hard as it is to guess why a service works, it is also very hard to guess why it doesn't work. But uh, our uh, findings were that possibly the reasons why it doesn't work here, and maybe uh, you know that before Lyft was Lyft, they were called Zimride. Uh, that was 2008-2010. Uh, it was the same team because it was founded by uh, Logan, uh, Logan Green. Uh, which is the reason why it was called uh, Zimride. 
And uh, actually, they tried to develop long distance carpooling, like what we were doing in Iraq. They did not succeed, even though they were starting from the Bay Area. They started to uh, try to create um, an axis between uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles. They raised 10 million for that. Uh, they did not succeed in, in kicking in the marketplace. So they pivoted to uh, the lift model now with uh, professionals, also my professional drivers, which is uh, a totally different model. And uh, actually, so this brings us to maybe think that uh, so the market was not ready, at least at that time. I don't know if it's ready now, but the market was possibly not ready. And um, the reasons why it may not work are twofold, we think. The first reason would be that uh, moving around with your own car is too cheap in the US. I mean, it's 350 a gallon. Uh, whereas if you converted the price, especially in dollars, that you pay in Europe, it would be uh, 7 or 8 dollars a gallon. Uh, so it makes a significant difference. Then the highways here are free, whereas in Europe uh, you have to pay for it. Uh, also the insurance for cars are lower here than they are in Europe. Uh, the cars themselves are lower, and then the GDP per inhabitant in the US is higher than anywhere else in the world. So when you compare all this, the pain of uh, lonely travelers, I would say, with their cars is not so, so high, it's not high enough that they think it's worth sharing the cost. And that's the first explanation. So the drivers don't bother to get like 20 or 25 bucks, uh, given uh, totally it's not a real pain for them to uh, move around with their car alone. Uh, the other reason which may explain why it did not pick up in the US is that um, the cities are more spread out and the public transit are not, are not as efficient in the US, especially on the west coast. Maybe on the east coast you may find some cities where the public transit is efficient, but actually if you are to drive from San Francisco to uh, Los Angeles, well, you have to say from where? Because it could be from Berkeley, from uh, uh, you know, Mountain View, uh, uh, Saratoga, or uh, whatever, to uh, Los Angeles, and then any district in Los Angeles. And if, as a driver, I leave my passenger in the middle of Los Angeles telling them, uh, so OK, now you'll finish by foot, uh, it simply doesn't work. <laughs> so the drivers have to go around the city uh, or the area uh, before they go to pick up their passengers and they have to go around the, the, the city as well when they drop them off which may make them lose an hour or an hour fifty out of the ride so uh, in addition to the fact that they would not get enough of money uh, out of sharing the ride because it wouldn't be a super expensive and super, uh, um, a super incentive they also may lose time so all this may explain why uh, carpooling has not picked up yet in the US <clears throat> the other thing is that uh, it brings more diversity in the car than in their lives. Uh, of course, they get to meet uh, people a, a lot more randomly than uh, with our lives. In our lives, we get to meet the people at the university, at, uh, uh, at, uh, at your workplace, or even where you live. And it's not as diverse as when you open the box, and like, you could meet just about anyone. And especially discussing with them and having two or three or four hours with them to discuss, which is not something which happens usually uh, in your life. The other thing is that uh, they have enriching uh, exchanges. Uh, there are also one statistics I, I love, uh, which is uh, we have 21% of the people who travel with Plana Car who say they've said to their carpoolers something they've never said to anyone else, uh, which means we've got a lot of secrets traveling. Uh, people confess to each other a lot, also because, you know, uh, just like when you go to the shrink and uh, you, uh, you don't have to really look at the person, like uh, uh, people look uh, in front, they look at the road, there is no eye contact between the people and they feel the talk. And so it can release a lot uh, of talking. And also it's someone you'll see two, three, four hours and then you say goodbye, you don't see them again, but you can simply use them as a shrink. And, and, uh, <coughs> and so it, it also explains why people tell secrets uh, so, so easily. Um, I even have a friend who told me, thank you, because thanks to you, I now understand women. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if it's true in the end, but actually he told me, well, I've been discussing with girls like never before because uh, they were telling me things uh, none of my girlfriends have ever told me. Uh, and so I could uh, understand a lot better things. And when I was asking the girls, well, did you say that to your boyfriend? I said, oh no, he's got to guess. They're like, well, yeah, you know, but uh, we're, we're, we're guys and we need 
to be told uh, sometimes things, and sometimes we don't guess uh, everything. Well, anyway, uh, it's, it's just uh, an anecdote. Um, so, 1.6 million tons of CO2 saved in a year. As I said, it's uh, the equivalent of, uh, well, it's even more than the, uh, uh, the equivalent of uh, Paris yearly road traffic uh, CO2 emissions. We published a study, which you can find, which is called Zero Empty Seats, where you'll find all this data. There is also a, a study uh, on trust, the, mention, the subject I mentioned before. If you look for trust, you look for uh, entering the trust age, which is a study we have published uh, like a, two or three years ago, uh, around the way we build trust in our network in order to reach this kind of scale and making sure that people can trust each other even though they've never met uh, and, and by having dozens of millions of people in the network. So where are we going now? Um, the, uh, so we, we want to be a go-to marketplace for shared world travel. So in Europe we have uh, carpooling and buses. Well, we also have the same in the rest of the world, but in a different, uh, slightly different model. It's still uh, carpooling and buses, but um, uh, the, the model we have here will uh, more be um, uh, a marketplace for buses, and here it's more like uh, uh, individual uh, agreements with some uh, bus carriers. Uh, so it's a, it's a bit of a different business model. For the end user, it doesn't change anything. But uh, for us, it's a different way of, uh, of organizing things. And we have, uh, on carpooling, in Europe, we have long distance and short distance. Blablarize is our short distance product. It's still like being experimented. It's got one million members in France. It's only in France for now. We're still testing the thing. Uh, but it's growing quite well. Especially, uh, like lately, I don't know if you've heard about the strikes we had in December and January in France, but it was a massive strike, and so people really, uh, really went into uh, carpooling uh, big time. Uh, we had a time stand uh, registration rate on the lines uh, during the strikes. Um, what we want to become is a virtual marketplace, uh, so that we become also a, a homepage app, as we call it, uh, meaning that people will. Uh, use you and put you on their homepage on their mobile. Um, we, we believe we have the potential to do that because especially with the short distance product which has a lot uh, higher frequency of usage, we reach more than 100 usage per year uh, with, uh, with Blabla Lines now. So when people use it once a year, on average they use it more than 100 times a year. So which makes it so that uh, it's a very, um, it's a usage which is quite recurring. And so by doing this, when people begin to use you like a uh, hundred times a year, then you have a very good chance of ending up in the homepage of those people and then uh, generate more traffic and more, um, uh, more exposure. Um, a few words now on the European tech scene. Um, so that's a number of European unicorns because I'm often told that, okay, there are not that many unicorns in Europe. Well, actually, it turns out we've got 175 unicorns now. So as you see, in the past three years, it's been accelerating a lot. Uh, and this is the VC funding trend in Europe between 2015 and 2019. And as you can see, uh, it's, it's growing now. It's uh, 36 billion in 2019. And the trend is really accelerating. The issue we're having with this is that, as we can see, capital is able to move pretty easily, and we're able to attract capital. Uh, actually, the other problem we're getting into now is that we're missing people and we're missing talented people who've been uh, working in hyper-growth environments. Uh, so, which is the reason why I told you I came here in Silicon Valley to uh, sensibilize um, all the people uh, here about the fact that the European scene is really changing and evolving and uh, we have lots of uh, scale-ups now uh, which are recruiting at super high level uh, and which are in phases of uh, hyper growth. And we need uh, talent, uh, people who've been uh, seeing the movie here in the Silicon Valley to come and help us. And especially there is a different DNA in those companies, uh, which is why all the movement that we've started here by doing the conference two days ago is called Tech for Values. Um, so just another a few numbers about the European uh, scene before we, we switch to Tech for Values. but. Um, this is a survey conducted by Atomico, a, a fund in, in Europe which has uh, uh, several, uh, well, their first fund was 800 million, and I think the second one is even higher. But um, they, they made a survey and like, they found like 
more than 500 companies, European tech companies, uh, which are tackling one of the UN's SDGs goals. You know, the SDGs is the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 goals. Uh, as a core part of their mission, they said uh, in their interview, 80% of the VCs assess the potential long-term societal and environmental impact of their investments, not only because they care, but also because they think it's strategic. Uh, and then in the capital invested, it's a similar number that you can see that the capital invested in purpose-driven European tech companies has been growing a lot in the past uh, four years. Um, that's some of the, uh, the purpose-driven companies. Uh, you don't place uh, blah blah car in it, but of course it is. Uh, because I think you, you've had enough of blah blah car uh, for, for a day, possibly. Um, and so these are some quotes uh, from, um, uh, from some of the CEOs and VCs uh, in Europe. I'll let you read them. I don't need to, to read them all. But actually, uh, there is some sort of uh, something a bit different, possibly, uh, in the DNA of companies which are uh, emerging now out of Europe, uh, which are or are about to become world leader in their field, and they actually um, uh, they actually deploy some models which do not exist in the US. Uh, so I'm thinking about uh, companies. I don't know if I have a slide of the companies. Well, you can find all the all those companies uh, on techforvalues.com you want to look at them, but there are companies, that are, I'll put a few, a few, but let's say uh, back market, I don't know if you've heard of them, um, it's, uh, so it's started in France, but it's a company which has, uh, uh, which has more than uh, half a billion uh, turnaround already, uh, only out of France, and they are expanding in the US now, uh, they are hiring 100 people, and they've got 250 people, and it's only a three-year-old company. Uh, you've got companies like Doctolib, I don't know if you've heard of them, but it's like a 1100 people, they are hiring 500 people right now. Um, you've got OVH, which is a European cloud as well, 2000 uh, employees. So all those companies are contributing to really, uh, um, to really uh, accelerating the tech scene. And so what we wanted to do here is to make a selection of those companies and uh, push them here and make some uh, communication around it just so people are aware that things are moving in Europe because I know what it is when I lived here and I was actually at the other school. Um, I know what it is. You tend to, uh, to forget very easily about your, uh, your home ecosystem. Also because the picture you have is outdated very, very fast because you're like, uh, you get so much information here in the valley that uh, you forget about uh, your, your own ecosystem and the image that stays in your head is the one of when you left. So I'm here to say to, uh, to the people who've left uh, maybe from Europe a few years ago that things are changing now. And so that uh, if they ever think about uh, getting back home, uh, we've got lots of uh, exciting job for them. Um, this is about it. Uh, we'll go for questions. That's been a bit longer than scheduled, but um, I'm waiting for your questions. Thank you. trains and everything 
And so they've been supporting for the past year, carpooling, so by subsidizing uh, some rights. So it's beginning. And so uh, since, uh, especially in France, carpooling is really something which has become very common. Uh, it's been easier for Ile de France Mobilité to think about carpooling in their plan for uh, public transports. And so they're, um, they're putting money now in carpooling, considering that, of course, uh, while well, it reduces uh, traffic jams, it reduces the pollution associated to it, and it's a big major concern for cities to reduce traffic um, and, and the pollution resulting from it. And also it makes the transportation of their citizens cheaper uh, by having less cars moving around. So it's becoming a reality, I would say, uh, at least in France and a bit in Europe. I think in the US, uh, it's not there yet. And possibly um, it would need, <coughs> there would need to be um, uh, some sort of coupling which works here in order for the uh, state to move. I'm sorry for my words. <coughs> a driver and two or three passengers. Tomorrow, if we've got to match three or four passengers, it's about the same work, actually. We're just matching people who are doing the same ride at the same moment, whether or not they have cars. Uh, then the thing is, <coughs> we don't know who would own the cars, the autonomous cars, but our network could be used with autonomous cars as well. <coughs> uh, hello, thank you for the conference. Uh, I have a question about entrepreneurship, especially on early stage for or people who are starting their own projects. Uh, in one end, you need to be certain and have faith in your projects. But in the other end, you need to be listening to your team, to your market. So uh, at the beginning, uh, how did you balance the two, especially when the project takes longer to take up? And, uh... <coughs> well, first, you have to be frugal uh, if you want to last. So um, if you don't want to spend too much money, the best solution is not to spend it. When you're like uh, bootstrapping, so everything you can do with your brain and not with money should be that. Um, then also, when you build your product, there are three ways, very complementary ways to build the best product. At the beginning of a market, it's a product race. Then after that, once once the concept has been proved, it's a capital race. <coughs> At the beginning, you've got to build the best product, and then when you get some traction. You raise money and then it goes to the pack. And you've got to also be uh, the first to raise the, the maximum amount of money if your concept works. But uh, in the first, in the early days, the best solution for you to build the best product is to to really see innovation as threefold. So it's un not only what you think is right, this is one part of the equation, but also you should benchmark all your competition. You should make sure that any good feature they have, you also have it. Uh, well, you, you leave them the bad features, but uh, the good features you should have them in your product, and so you should benchmark all the time your competition, and uh, not be shy about it. Like try anything, and if something is good with your competitor, then uh, you just implement it as well. And the third part of how you grow is really by listening to your early adopters, if they are golden. And so really, uh, I see sometimes uh, projects failing just because they consider that they are best source of inspiration is their own brain, it is not. Uh, your best source of inspiration is really threefold by your brain, the competitor's brains, and your uh, customer's or early adopter's brain. So then, once you build the best product, if your market is supposed to grow, then what will happen, especially in the society we are now, where people can actually switch from one service to the other by using a click, um, is that uh, if your product is better, and people are interested in your activity, they'll be talking to each other, and then they'll know which product is the best. And so uh, even your competition will be actually working for you to recruit your next people. And we saw that happening in carpooling when we had some competitors which, are, which had inferior products. They were communicating around their product, 
they were recruiting new members, but then when people were to couple together, what was being said in the cars was, uh, well, yeah, but you know, Blah Blah Car is uh, a better product. And so uh, even though they had been recruited by competition, they would end up at Blah Blah Car. And so competition was helping us recruiting as well. Yes? Yeah, we do ID checks, and we, we, so we we check uh, some uh, IDs and also um, phone numbers, and then you have ratings. People get to meet each other and then they leave ratings to each other. Uh, we have a very active as well customer support, which we call uh, the uh, community relations team, and they are always monitoring uh, everything which is happening in the network. So it's a mix of everything. But it's really by adding things, you know, it's just like security. Security, there's no like big ball for security. Security is a multiple, uh, it's, a, it's a, uh, like, I don't know, for, for example, to avoid fraud on a system, it's not by just placing one single magic bullet that would uh, uh, forbid anyone from frauding the system. It's by having like 25, 30, 40 different checks that make you think that this is a fraud and then you, uh, you tackle it. Uh, it's the same for building trust or for uh, building trust is not safety in the network. It's uh, the sum of several things that uh, allows you to build trust. Yes? Actually, we tried six business models. Uh, it turned out uh, the six one worked, which is why you need to be very frugal because, like, <laughs> the by the time. You get to the six business model, you're like, okay, this one's better work because otherwise I don't, I, I run out of ideas. Uh, so the business model which works for us is a commission-based model, so it's really easy. I would say it's the same as uh, Airbnb, to implement it about at the same time. Yes. Smartest people you need. That's all. That's all. Uh, I'd say, well, it's a shortcut. But uh, and, and then today I'm the chairman, but I'm not running the company. It's uh, Nico, my co-founder, who's really uh, running the uh, uh, the CEO of the company. And so it's uh, well, I don't know. Then you have a, uh, an executive team of uh, highly talented people in their field, and then uh, just hire the smartest people you find and convince them. Your role is actually to recruit. How would you convince them? Ah, you talk to them and then you convince them. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Could you tell us uh, a bit uh, more about this intermodal concept, intermodal journey concept? So I understand it's a combination of a private car probably with bus, local buses. So are you going to be partnering with bus companies? Or we, are we, you going to So we uh, already partner with bus companies in our model for deploying buses, but it's actually by simply uh, offering the combination of uh, um, the first uh, trip, the second one, with a connection. <coughs> and you could have first a carpool and then a bus. But then we don't do that yet. Huh? It's, a, it's a, a, a long term strategy. And so before being able to do intermodal, you need to be able to do multimodal, which is a step we're It's an interesting growth from C to C to B to C. So I'm curious how you, you kind of started with the hardest problem. No, 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 no. I didn't talk about the six business models we used, but the first one was a B2B business model. So selling uh, SaaS platforms to companies who wanted to implement coupling for their employees. But, um, so one of them was that. Actually, it was the first uh, business model we tried, which worked decently, but it, it wouldn't scale as fast. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a different skill set as well. You need uh, people in the teams who are able to discuss with uh, partners uh, and maybe best operators. Have you, so, to do intermodal now, have you thought about passengerless transportation, matching things with people as well? What do you mean? Well, uh, if you talk about 
growth. People yeah. are buying more things on the internet. Buying more things? I, uh, I I'm not sure I understand the question. I'll ask you later. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, like crowd shipping, are you familiar with that concept? Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's another model which could be uh, plugged on uh, on the community. It's not something we've developed yet. Yeah. Uh, you, you already asked the question, so I'll ask you. Uh, what, is a, what is a general feature of the business customers in Plaza Car compared to other similar companies? Yeah. Um, I mean, you search, like, let's say, like in metropolitan areas. Yeah. people will be using the platform uh, between two and ten times a year. On short distance, it's uh, 100 times a, a year on average. Uh, and then on the profiles, um, it will be basically people who move on distances of 200, 300, 400 miles. So usually uh, it's um, either <coughs> students in uh, very good universities or professionals who decided to to go work away from their place. So it's actually the higher of, uh, I would say, of uh, the uh, people, the, well, the people who are moving, not the people who've got local jobs. <coughs> Sorry for that. So I didn't go to China, by the way, so I <laughs> work. Seminar, we always give our speaker a little thing to remember Berkeley by. Thank you so much again for coming. It's been a real pleasure today.